Scotland. A land of stories whispered on the wind. Carried by the waves that crash on the shore. City lights, country roads, misty mornings by the coast. Each photograph is a poem. Each journey, a diary of Scotland as we alone have seen it. There is no friend as loyal as a book or a song. And with every friendly face you meet, a new tale to be told. A new wonder to behold. A chance to be bold, to tread lightly and protect this place for future stories to come. So gather round and listen in. It's time for this story to begin. 2022 is Scotland's year of stories. Come and discover your own tale of Scotland. When two lovers me down beneath the green bower, when two lovers me down beneath the green tree, their merry, lovely Mary exclaimed unto her darling. You have stolen my poor heart on the banks of the lee. Every bush and every bower, every wild Irish flower will remind me of my merry the banks of the lee. Never go out too late on the moorlands, my Mary. Never go out too late on the moorlands for me. For little was her notion as we parted on the ocean, we were parting forever on the banks of the chorus. Every bush and every bower, every wild Irish flower. <laughs> well, remind me, oh, my Mary, on the banks of the lea. I will pluck for her some roses, some wild Irish roses. I will pluck for her some roses, the finest ever grew, and I'll place them on the grave of my true lover Mary. In that little silent churchyard, where she sleeps neath the dew, Every bush and every bower, every wild Irish flower will remind me of oh, my Mary on the banks of the lee. Great 
she loves to do it. Did you hear how she said chorus? Well, we sing it. Yes. Good. Every bush and every flower, every wild Irish flower, will remind me of my Mary on the banks of the Lee. She'd love that. If she was sitting here, she would love that, because that's what she did. She needed to hear the song. And that was a lovely song about um, Sheila. And at the time when it was filmed, she wasn't very well. She was getting, you know, to a point where she was starting to... She had an illness and, and it returned. And so she was getting a wee bit feeling like um, <coughs> she had done everything with her life. So. She sang a lot of her favourite songs and told a lot of her favourite stories. Now, Sheila's family, the Stuarts of the Blair, uh, the uh, Stuarts of Blair Gowdy, if you don't, if you're, you know, you haven't heard about them, they became very famous uh, on the, the folk revivalist sort of platform. And Hamish Henderson was introduced to the Stuarts of Blair by Maurice Fleming, who was the editor of the Scots magazine at the time. And when he heard them, he thought, oh my gosh, this is just fantastic. There was Sheila, there was our sister Cathy, there was a, a mother, Belle, Belle Stuart, the, the father, Alex Stuart. And before no time at all, the family were travelling the world and they were singing the travelling songs because they were travelling folk and the stories and the riddles and, and Alec was playing his pipes and everybody, you know, and, and all over uh, Scotland knew of the Stuarts of Blair. But I would like to share with you tonight a wee story that they had been famous through someone else. Alec's father, Jock Stewart, was a piper and he was renowned across the country. Now rather than sit here and blare it to you, I'm going to read you his obituary. And it was in the People's Journal on Saturday the 9th of July in 1955 and it says everything about Jock and, and I really want to share this with you. As old John Stewart lay dying at the home of his son, Mr. Alexander Stewart, Berry Bank in Rancher, he asked his son to play some tunes on the chanter. His son declined, and he placed the chanter in his father's hand. Then the old man, for he was nearly eighty-five, took the chanter in his fingers, from which the strength was slowly ebbing, and he raised it to his lips. He managed to sound it, but his fingers had lost their cunning, and he could not raise a tune. Soon afterwards, he slipped away. <coughs> Now those fingers had charmed many an audience, for he and his pipes were never far apart. Noble houses had known his playing. For eight years he was personal piper to the late Duke of Athol. From 1910, when he was at his peak, and during those eight years he was champion piper of Scotland. Traveller man. In 1919 came the supreme moment in his piping career. He won a gold medal at Edinburgh and he was called to play before King George V. Sheila used to tell the stories. Do you remember, Donald? Sheila used to say, my grandfather was a big, <coughs> you know, a big rough traveling man, and he won a gold medal for the king, King George V. And in those days, if you did anything like that, you had to kiss the king's hand, and he didn't want to kiss the king's hand. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, he thought, and the king had the, the the coin in his hand, this gold coin, but it's not a coin, sorry, a medal. And he thought, well, I'll no get that, but then he kissed that. <laughs> so he kissed the king's hand and he got this gold medal and before the day was over he'd sold it. <laughs> <laughs> so for a fortnight, for two weeks, while the king was in residence at Holyrood, John was official piper there. Has anybody told the Scottish government about that? <laughs> he was fantastic. He was also a composer, and best known of his tunes are Pitlochry Pipe Band and Dunkel Bridge. 
He was well known around the games. Bramar, Aboyne, Oban, Inverness, Blackford, Thorn, they all knew his god figure, his long flowing moustache and the charm of his music. But none knew him better than Glen Isla, where he attended the games regularly for 63 years. The Dowager, Countess of Ailey, invariably looked around for John when she arrived at the games, for he vied with her for the most regular appearances there. They knew each other well, and her ladyship sought him out to reminisce during the games and remark that his old kilt was still wearing well. For he was proud to tell her, there the old vegetable dyes in this kilt, wife, you'll no get them like this new. <laughs> he was playing at a gathering for the dancers while the solo piping was being judged. He finished his accompaniment and he walked over to compete in the piping, and the judge stopped him. You didn't need to play, John, he said. We heard you playing when you accompanied the dancers, you've won, man. <laughs> so, born in Peterhead, John came south to marry in Kenmore. He was well known in Angus and Persia, touring the countryside with a little cart dealing in scrap. He taught all his sons to play the pipes and many other pupils besides. One of his pupils played him to his last resting place to Aylith Cemetery at one of the biggest funerals seen in the district for many years. 300 people came from all parts of Scotland to pay their last respects and stood outside the house in Rattray in a silent throng while the Reverend A.F. Taylor Young of Hill Church in Blue Gowrie conducted the funeral service. At the cemetery he was born to the grave by his eldest surviving son Alec, his grandsons John and Andrew Stewart and Billy Higgins, and his nephews Andrew and David Stewart. Before them marched Piper Hugh McMillan of Kirkmichael, whom he had taught to play so many years before. He played Lord's Love It's Moment as the coffin was carried to the grave and the floors of the forest as he was laid away. Joe Stewart, I wanted to get a picture for you. I wanted to get a big picture for you, but I'm awfully slow with these things, but if you can just on the light there see the, the famous Jock Stewart, long before Hamish Henderson appeared. <laughs> the king himself and everybody connected with them, the, the, Duke, the Dukes of Arthur, eight times their champion piper. Sheila used to share a story and she did it every time because the, the most important thing about Sheila to, with her balance and her stories was humour. She had to have her audience laugh, and she used to feel, she'd say, oh, I've never done nothing with them, they weren't happy, if she didn't raise a smile, a smile. So she would tell you, if you remember, this story about her grandfather, Joke. He was, uh, as, as he was the, the Honourable Piper of the Dukes of Arthur, he was playing in the Great Hall of Blair Castle. And if you've been in the, the Great Hall, you know, it's, it's a tourist Area. You can actually go in at a certain time of the year. It's a massive place and there's balconies all over the place. And Jock was up there on the balcony playing his pipes. And he was getting it loudly. And the Duke went up and he says, John, you've been excellent. You've been absolutely wonderful. Lay you down and have a wee dram to yourself, man. So when he went down and he had the dram, this lady came up. Now, it was one of these balls, you know, these, these balls where the women wore crinoline dresses, hundreds of petticoats, and men had their kilts on and that. Oh, it was a, I was a grand do. And this lady came over and she said, Piper, she said, it's a lady's choice, would you do me the honour? And uh, oh, I, I don't mind, lady, my dear, so of course, big man, strong man, dashing white sergeant. <laughs> well, did you know love this creator? <laughs> and you bottle her round about. <coughs> to such an extent, and it, she just lost all power for a second, and she let out this rout of a fart. <laughs> and she couldn't do a thing about it. So, he, he, this is the type of gentleman he was. He stepped a couple of steps back, and he apologised. He took the blame. <laughs> he knew how embarrassed you would be. I mean, how could you be embarrassed, Farton? It's part of the body's way of saying, excuse me, you've got too much carrots or Brussels sprouts or something. Anyway, at the, end, at the end of the night, the dear lady came up and she put something in his hand and she says, thank you very much, Piper, you know, and, you ain't. and she just walked away with a wee wink. 
And he was so halfway down the road when he wondered where it was, and uh, he couldn't read, so he probably thought it's a note, he's just thanking him for whatever. But when he opened it up, it was a five pound note. It was going in old fashioned white five pound notes, and he went, Well, well, well. It's the first time I ever got a fiver for a fart. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> she had a way with telling stories, and, and the next piece of film, which we'll be showing in a wee while, um, well, well, I'll introduce that to you. And if you're a storyteller, the, the thing about Sheila was, she, you, you would hear a story, and about ten different endings and beginnings and, and uh, thoughts would come in your head about how you could, you know, manoeuvre through that tale. She was an expert storyteller. She was an amazing singer. She, she got the songs from her mother, but her uncle Donald taught her how to sing them, how to put them across. She had her own cantaract, and if you got the, high, the more you go up the highlands and into the islands, it's usually the women folk that have the cantaract. And Sheila would, um, especially when we were in schools, you know, she would teach the bird. Because we went through about a dozen schools in Leeds and see every wen in that school could talk the can and Kent how he'd play a set of bagpipes with Sheila telling them the canter. She, and, and I've seen her with wee wens and she'd go, and she would lift her fingers off, you know, off the, the pipes. Pipers in here, you can't even hear about them. You'll know what I'm talking about, eh? and, the, and the wee pink agent that, and she would say, hadra, hadra, and the only wee English bird, you know, trying to get their tongue around the, the Sheila's cantera. Bell, I thought, Bell had a fantastic cantera. My mother had one. It's, it's amazing how we've lost so much of these these ancient ways, and um, it's, it's getting to a point now you don't get enough of it. I, I hope that those those powers that are out there actually get a hold a hold of what the wind is the gales is blowing through Scotland, grab a hold of it and bring it back and, and let our young folk learn a wee bit more about what Sheila offered and the Stuarts of Lear. I knew um, a lot of songs, but I, I was more into writing, I just wanted to write uh, as much as I could and, and, and study as much as I could for other, other travellers, because you're a traveller, but you only know your own people, your own story. We're very clannish, you know, it's like all the clans, even the, the McPhees, the McDonalds, the um, McGregors, and all of the Smiths, all the clans, the Mc, McFarlands, they're all out there. But um, the travellers are exactly the same, you know, they just want to have their own ways. Many you folks, the border travellers in the Lancashire, tra Lancashire travellers, <laughs> 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 they were different as well. And so we, we're losing so much of that, that stories and that culture. Um, she, Belle, the wonderful Belle, had a lot of songs that she used to sing. And one that I heard her sing when I was about 12, <coughs> 13, was a song called um, Late Last Night, and I never really knew why she chose such a sad song, uh, you know, in the middle of summer where the sun was burning hot. But when you read Sheila's book, Queen Among the Heather, about her mother, you'll understand why she, she used to sing some very sad songs. I don't know anything about it. I think it's it could be Irish, it could be whatever. But I'll try to sing uh, late last night to you. Joss, did you sing? <coughs> you can hundreds of late last night. Hi, I'm away at the back. Yeah, <laughs> you'll know that one. I don't think so. I might. I'll, I'll join you. in a It's an easy one. So. <laughs> late last night, I was asked to wedding. The wedding of a fair maid who proved to be unkind. For as she looked in the eyes of her new intended lover, thoughts of her old love did run through her mind. Supper was over, the sermon was ended, and every young man had to sing the bride a song. Then when it came to the turn 
of her old intended lover, thoughts of their romance did run through his mind. How can you sit at another man's table? How can you drink of another man's wine? And tell me how can you lie in the arms of another when I need you? Sobbing and sighing, she ran to her bedroom. Sobbing and sighing, she went to her bed. Early next morning, her bridegroom awakened and turning on. Dear Annie, I know you never loved me, but my love and your love could never agree. And I knew fine, I had taken you feel better, I feel better. Better than ever I could be. But I shall put on my suits of deep mourning, suits of deep mourning, one, two, and three. Then I shall put on wedding garments to remind me, dear Annie, that you married me. You heard it? my dog and my gun all along 
It's not really a ghost story, but it's the traveller says it's a true story. And it's the God's honest truth. Because as my father said, travellers never tell lies. God forgive me. Anyway, there was this travelling family and they were up near Dunkeld. Now, there was the man and the woman and a boy and a girl. But the woman was very heavily pregnant. She was due to have her baby in maybe a few weeks' time. Now, the best camping place in Perthshire was up at Dunkel. And the first family that went there and got that piece of ground for the winter was lucky. So this man and woman and their two kids got to this place before any other traveller, put the tent up and their bow tent and that. And now, the men in a travelling family they create, like, the tinsmiths and things like that. But it's the woman that does the hawking to sell them. So they landed there, they put the, the fire on, a big roaring fire, and they were all sitting. And the wife looked at him, she says, Look, John, she says, I know I'm the hawker, I can get the money, she says. But tomorrow, she says, I don't feel like going out hawking. Do you think you could do it? Because the men doesn't hawk. So he looked at him and she said, ah, he said, I'll go and try it. I've never tried it, he says, but I'll go and do it. So the next morning he got up and, and he went away down to Dunkel. And he went and chapped the doors. He, you needn't any work done. You can, uh, can I clear your path for you? Things like that, because it was coming in the winter time. So he did two or three jobs. Now, they made five shillings that day. Now, they hadn't a bite to eat in the house, in the tent. So he says, my God, five shillings will get me a lot of groceries. It'll feed the family for a week. So he goes and he buys eyes groceries and he bought food for a slurich. Now, a slurich to the travelling folk is, is putting sausages in a pot and, and uh, 
tatties in a pot, onions, carrots, just making a big slurry. And that would last him for two or three days. So he come home to his wife and he got bread and butter and jam and all, oh, because five shillings went a long way. So they lived very high for about three days. And then in their bed on the third night, she says, John, she says, we've got no food for tomorrow. Well, he said, I'll just have to go out again and try. So next morning, away he goes down to Dunkel. But the jobs that he tried to get, he had done them the day before. He says, nah, tuppence halfpenny he got. And that wasn't much. But I would buy a loaf of bread and a jar of jam. Well, he says, that'll keep the bairns going, a piece of jam. That'll do them the night. So he said, I'm going to weigh him. And the snow started to drift. It was coming down. So he's passing this butcher shop at the tail end of Dunkel. And the butcher was standing there, a big fat man he was with the butcher's apron on. He says, excuse me, eh, butcher, he says, but do you have any stotting bits? Now, stotting bits to a traveller is what the butcher is going to be thrown away. But you could make a slurry with or something you can. So the butcher says, yes, I do, he says. Come in, he says, and I'll show you what I've got, he says. So he went and stood at the counter, and the butcher put his hand down under the counter, and he left this thing out. And he plonked it on the counter. Now, it was a pig's head huge pig's head. So when the travelling man saw it, he says, oh my God, he says, it'll last me for days, he said. Wonderful. How much do you want for it? No, 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 he says, you just take it away, I'll wrap it up for you. So he wrapped it up in a newspaper and he's away home whistling now. But when he gets towards the tent, he hears enough he carry on going on in the tent laughing and teeing and, and shouting and singing in it. He says, I wonder what they're up to. I says, I'll soon stop them in a minute. So he goes to this tree and he breaks a branch off it and he sticks it through the pig's head and he goes to the corner of the tent and he lifts the corner up and he puts the branch through with the pig's head and he goes, Aah! well, they started to scream. And he run, she run out, the bairns run out, and she collapsed at his feet with a fright. Oh, she says, never do that. I'm a pregnant woman, she says, and you can't do that. God's going to curse us for you frightening me. So the snow was coming heavier, and he apologised, you can said he was sorry, he shouldn't have done it and that. So two days passed and she took her pains to have the baby. So she says, look, she says, John, could you take the two bairns, she says, down to my mother, she buys five miles down the road in another tent to look after them until I hear the baby. Now, long, long ago, no nurse or doctor would attend a confinement you know, a having of a baby, because they said they had no facilities in a bow tent. So whoever was there had to help the woman have the baby. So he went down and he gave the two bairns to her mother and he come back up. And it was drifting of snow. But when he got to the tent, the baby was just ready to be born. And of course he had to help his wife. And he got the baby and he lifted it up and he did that. And she says, let me see my baby, let me see my baby. He says, you didn't want to see the baby, he said. And he's looking at it. Turn it and let me see the bairn. So he turned the baby around like that and let her look at it. And it had a piglet's head. The baby's head was a piglet. Oh, she started screaming. Oh, my God. Throw, get rid of it. I don't want it. Throw it out. That's no my baby. So he left the door of the tent and he catched the baby and he threw it into a drift of snow. 
and he was sitting down and she was greeting and greeting and she looked at him, she says, John, where's the baby? Who's that? Is that you, Hamish? No, mummy. Anyway, she, she, uh, started greeting. Go and get the baby, she says. No matter what it looks like, she says, it's our baby. Get it, but he says, you tell me to get rid of it. What did you do with it? I threw it out in the snow. Get it. So out, out he goes and, and the mark of the baby was in the snowdrift. So he was raking the snowdrift and raking the snowdrift like that. And uh, he got the baby, but it was full of snow. So he took it back into the tent and he's wiping all the snow off the baby you can. And he wiped its face last and he looked at it. And it was the most beautiful baby girl you'd ever seen. So he turned it to her and she looked at her, ah, oh, she got her baby in that, you know. And, and uh, she said, he says, what happened? Your fault, she said. You frightened me with a pig's head. So God sent an omen to us and made weird baby look like a piglet's head. Well, she got out of the bed and she started battering at him for frightening her so much. So the, the omen for the travellers, never frighten a pregnant woman because you never know what you could get. And the traveller swears in their own way that that story was true. Gruffy is a travelling word for a pig. And when, I, when she told me that story, as we were driving down the road, she says, tell it to folk. I said, I would not tell it to folk. I wish a person takes a wee baby and you born and flings it out of the <laughs> Well, we starts arguing her and I go down the road. And I said, Sheila, that's not true. I swear to you, that's true. And I wouldn't believe her. And now, I was to meet a woman, uh, I can't remember, a couple of years later for the Borland and Fife. And I was telling her that, and she said, that's true. She said, that story, I heard that story as well. She says, but the man thought that the fiend had come in, the fairies, and stole the newborn baby. It was a changeling. And she, with a candle, you no, know, just a candle light, and him being in the tent at a birth, it was bad luck for a man to be at a, a woman's birth, you know, in a, um, a travelling community. And he'd never seen a newborn baby covered in birth fluid, and he thought it looked like a pig. And he turned around and, he see, and she says, that happened. I said, well, I never would have thought it. I never would have thought that. And I says, but he never put through the bell and out of the tent. She says, no, he probably just sat it out. That's Sheila again, making it sound <laughs> really, really. But superstitions, loads of superstitions. And we got into the, to Leeds and uh, Peter Saunders, the name of the organiser, and I said, Sheila's been in an office state with, with Tusik. No bother, he turned around, he put her in the car, took her up to the infirmary, and she says to me, uh, tell a story or, or introduce one of my songs, but don't you dare sing Queen Among Ever, that's my song. I said, I'm getting the words out. She says, but tell a story. I said, Sheila, you're going away to hospital. You don't know what they're going to do. I'll be back, she said. <laughs> and she came into the theatre, and it was about 100 people, and she had this great big massive wad of cotton wool piled into the hole where the eye tooth had become. And she went up on stage and started singing, and the blood was running down the side. <laughs> And I says to her, you're not going to blame that on the knife. She says, I blame what happened today on the knife. So it's memories like that. that sometimes I, I live in a way in the Glen and sometimes she'll suddenly come into my head and, and I'll hear her, we argued the whole time, and I'll hear her saying, hi, Lady Lockett. 
could you do this? And could, cause she just, she loves Sheila. You know, you didn't get any airs and graces with her. That's, that's what you got. And everybody loved her for her honesty and, and that thing. But anyway, when, when Jamie had said that he was, he was going to um, show the gruffy story, I thought, oh my God, I'm being faced again with this wee baby getting thrown in the <laughs> But you know, that, that, um, what, what we tried to do in, in that film was to show you the snow piled up on either side of the road as, as the, the, the guys were going up. And then outside the wee house, the snow. And when you think about travelling people in winter time, you really don't know about travellers. Like the hedgehog, you know, we just, we, we hibernated and go by um, on a daily basis. But that's when the stories took on a life of their own, because winter was four o'clock, darkness came at four o'clock, and if you're in a little tent, and you've got to make sure there's enough sticks in, and you've got to make sure there's food ready and everything like that, it's, it's just a little world within this very, very, you know, um, easily destroyed abode. And the stories can take on, you know, a, a will, a strength of their own, and, and they live on through generations. Um, Andy Stewart, Put your hands up, those that remember Andy Stewart. It's probably going to be yeah. one hand on one. Maybe you don't mind the Andy Stewart. Uh, when television took off in Britain, and we produced <coughs> this fantastic <coughs> Scottish tele uh, programme called The White Heather Club. Yes. And Andy yes. used to come in, I think he's an Arbroath man, in his tent and everything, and he would sing Scottish soldiers and all kinds of things. And whatever was on uh, the television, you know, it didn't matter. People actually went out and purchased the television just to get Andy Stewart because he was just fantastic. <laughs> he also was a bit of a poet. And uh, a lady that I had met in Creef, she says to me one day, a long while back, she says, here's a wee poem I have for you, Jess. And she recited it to me. I says, that's beautiful. She says, that's one of Andy Stewart's poems. I didn't write it, she says, she says it was a Reverend Oswald that wrote it. I don't know if the Reverend Oswald was from Edinburgh. It was a, it's a poem called Tully Met. Let me share it with you now. <clears throat> Just imagine the snow in the tent and everything like that. And in those days, um, we weren't called travellers, we were called tinkers. So the poem has the word tinkers in it. A Christmas Eve I'll ne'er forget, Twas on a braise at Tully Met, And in a hen to an old stained dyke, I come across a tinker's tyke, A hussy, just a boy, nae ben, Was a the wife and Bernie's kent, But covered wi a whirl of sna, Was just a then a mansion bra. You, a listen, as inside the wee gins prattled, As outside a snell wind rattled, the Mr. Teacher says that Santa Claus comes round the braise and if you just hang out your stocking and Mother Deary was no joking, he'll fall and fool the finest fellies. Oh, Mammy, hang up mine and Charlie's. Oh, that Mr. Was our donut fool to teach our bairn a thing like that at school? Does he know, Ken, that Santa does not come to our old tent without a lump? Aye, but mummy, if you hang up yours, you might just leave a wee bit booze, and then again a bit of twist. You great, the sick a thing you missed. Well, him a gate, and I couldn't sleep to our winks for thinking of the pair we takes. So back a gate, and lying in among the dockings was four frozen empty stockings. Well, I felt them food to nearly bursting with sweetie cake and dram for the thirsting, and as I could hear the road so lying, I'm sure I heard an angel sign. <laughs> <laughs> Tully Met um, by the Reverend Oswald, recited by the late Andy Stewart. I, I actually love that. I bet I should have a wee look here and see what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila uh, and I were in Shropshire. Um, many years ago at Festival at the Edge, it's a festival at the Edge run by a wonderful Indian, um, well, Indian origin, Peter Shand, and he's just a perfect, perfect storyteller, terrific organiser. And it was my first visit to Shropshire Festival at the Edge, <coughs> and Sheila's first visit since she lost her mother, Belle. And when we arrived at the, the site, it was just bucketing bucking down. You couldn't even, you know, it was battered off the car. And Davy's looking out the window, he says, it's just look at the gutters, I can't even anywhere to park. And Sheila says, never mind that, Davy, she says, 
Ah, oh, the place is intense. And look at my feet. I can't even walk through all that gutter. She says, we'll need to go into the wee village and get much Wenlock, I think the name of the village was, and get myself decent shoes. So David did a, a, a turn around and went into the village. There was one shop selling shoes. And he had totally ran out of wellies. Apart from a size 9 and a size 4. Now, she was a size 5, so I, dabbed, I grabbed the size 4 and I says, well, I'm having these for my feet. And Sheila says, I'm not caring what size they are. Give me the size 9. <laughs> well, she bought the wellies and away to the side and, you know, all the hello everybody cuddles and, and we're all great, you know, storytellers together. And Sheila knew everybody, so it was, a, oh, it was an amazing time for her. And that night was uh, her uh, show, which was packed. The whole tent was chock a block with Marquee. And um, there was two wee chairs for her and I to sit there. And she says, now I've got a wee treat for you folks the night. She says, I'm going to sing the Queen Among the Heather. And everybody's going, oh, Sheila's going to sing Queen Among the Heather. Now I know she says it was my mommy, Belle, she says, that sung that. Wouldn't you let me sing it, she said. But Mavi, you're not here the night. She passed away, and Sheila, and I swear to you, this is the truth. She just looks at the tent, she says, well, my mom is not here the night, so the song is mine. The back legs of that chair burst, she landed in a heap, and the bellies went up in the air, and the gutters landed over. She had a beautiful black lurex dress on, and she was covered in gutters. And she went, Mother, did you have to? <laughs> <laughs> so that is Sheila's uh, Queen Among the Heather, which thankfully we'll hear in a little while. She, she had this fantastic way of, of uh, finding songs. I've never heard some of the songs, I don't know where she found them for, but she would find a song and she would start singing it. And, uh, and, and I just, just miss her so much when she. She does her singing thing. So anyway, that was the Gruffy, and that was the Sheila's version of it. And I've got to keep my eye on the time because the Herbie lassie's coming, Amanda's coming in to do the next show. So anyway, um, as as we, time got on and Sheila got less and less in it and that, we, we did wee wonders and wee walks and things like that. And I was to learn so much more that she'd never shared uh, with anybody and, and that um, <coughs> I feel like we've missed, you know, a perfectly wonderful lady. She got an MBE for her, not just sharing her stories and her songs and that, but she actually did an awful lot of work for the child and folk and she was instrumental um, in mainly getting sites for travellers that hadn't been uh, there before. The one in Perth, the Double Dykes one, Sheila went to an awful lot of meetings. And she met, when she didn't, she, she went to England and worked for the travellers here as well, and she met a man called Malcolm Rifkin, do you mind of him? Mm -hmm. uh, a, a guy, yeah. And, that. and I remember she was telling me about Malcolm, she says, oh, what a man for telling dirty jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm Rifkin? <laughs> Not at all. Oh, I, I. So she told me a few jokes, and so whenever I see Malcolm Rifkin, I feel like shouting to the telly, Do you mind? Tell them this one. <laughs> Tell us what you're she. <laughs> Love it. So anyway, um, that was going to. I was going to tell you another wee story there, and it went straight out. This is what I'm doing. Do you notice, Donald, when you get to a certain age, how your head's full of things and you <laughs> shoot out? <laughs> it gets worse. Dave and I live on um, an estate called Invergelly, and we've lived there for about 12 years. And um, I, I want to share this with you because we, uh, the family that owned Invergelly, had owned it for you know a couple of generations and that, and they've been there a long, long, long time. And we're only tenants, and they're lovely people. There are no restrictions, and if you anything out of windy pain, you just phone the estate agent, and there's somebody there to fix it. Well, a few months ago, we got word from the estate that the, uh, <coughs> the, the owners are too old, and they've got too many grandchildren, and that, that they, they've decided to sell up, to sell the estate, 
And uh, so that, when you're a tenant, you know, when you come to our age, you go, oh God, where are we going to go? You know, you know, have we got enough money to go somewhere else? We can't buy a place, what are we going to do? So it's the very first time in my life in Scotland I've actually felt that, that a bit uneasy about what is happening in Scotland regarding um, sales of estates, land ownership and things like that. So we've been told that the people who have bought over the estate are Oxygen House, get Googler, Oxygen House, and they're going to call where Invergeldi, where we are, Conservation Invergeldi. So, next chapter, yeah, Don, could you just imagine, you know, me away from there? But it's another story. It's another chapter in my life. And actually, when I got to a certain age, I thought, well, there's not many chapters left, but it sounds like there may just be another chapter in my life. I don't know whether I'll move up to Orkney. Do you know, Jen? We we'll go up to Orkney. Or he's not going. He's not going. He's a he's he's a mountain. He's the old man of the mountain. Maybe I could just see David going anywhere bar the hills. He's a chief man. Um, let me tell you how we met. I was uh, 17. No, I was in 16 actually. I want to say 17. I was 16, and I was going to ban the bomb. You know, the bomb was really big in those days, and I got this hippie dress and had knitted actually a crochet a red rose for my hair. Every C N D supporter had a red rose, even the men wore them. And I was going away to London to ban the bomb. I heard that that's where you go. So my man and daddy were staying in a caravan park, a caravan site in uh, Creef. And I thought, right, I'll go off the train here, I'll get a, tr a bus to Creef and I'll go and see how mum and daddy are and then I shall um, get myself away to London to ban the bomb. So my mummy looked at me with this chiffon dress that I'd been given to me for a woman of about six feet and I'm only five feet so it's all hanging down about my ankles and she says, Jessie, take, tuck it in your knickers, you're going to trip yourself up. I says, I'm fine. And she says, what, what are you, look at you, what's this rose in your hair and all that? You look like a field of flowers if you don't mind me saying so. Mother, I says, this is serious business nowadays, there's a bomb and I've got to go and ban it. Where is it? I don't know, but I have to go in London. There's no bombs in London. <laughs> I said, well, Mommy, this one's in London. I was as thick as my mother. And she <laughs> says, can I just ask you to do one thing for your old mother? She says, don't stand too near it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and before you go, she says, here, would you, would you go? I've got a sore back. You go along the wee grocers and get me some messages, get me some shopping. So I went along and um, I got what she needed, put them in a wee basket, paid for them and they come out. And right enough, her words were ringing in my ear, you're going to trip yourself up because I never had elastic in my knickers, so it <laughs> fell. And away I went. All the messages were scattered all over the, the, the uh, High Street, King Street. And I picked myself up and I said, please, whoever's in charge of everything, make everybody be blind or just make me go back a, a few seconds. But it, it didn't, because this pair of winkle pickers was uh, in right in front of my vision and these two strong arms picked me up and I looked into the bluest eyes I had ever seen. I was one of eight girls, never had any brothers, I wasn't very good with men, and here am I looking at the handsomest man I'd ever seen. <laughs> now, I don't know what happened to the bomb, <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that I was wearing sensible clothes, uh, brogy shoes that my mummy had um, hawked off a woman along the road, and I was pushing a pram up King Street, and there I have remained, with the fella sitting there. <laughs> He's still a pain, a pain. People say you argue every time I see you, you're arguing. 50 odd years, what are we, 56 years married? And he'll say, in answer to that, this person says, You're always arguing. Every time I see you, you're nip, nip, nipping at each other. And he just calmly says, Well, you see, that's why we've stuck all this length of time together, because neither one of us has won the argument yet. <laughs>
my mother, she was a great singer and a great woman. We were always camping and that, going away up north and other uh, places. And uh, it was always among heather. So my mother was called Queen Among the Heather. And that is the sacred song of my family. Every time I sing it, I feel as if I've heard it for the first time. And I mean, I've been singing it. I was never allowed to sing that song because that was my mother's song. And I didn't start singing that song until my mother died because I wasn't allowed within my family. But I can sing it now. Now as I rove down to one summer's morn Among lofty hills and moorland and mountain It was there I spied a lovely maid While the with others was out a hunting, no shoes and her stockings did she wear, neither had she hat, nor had she feathers, but her golden locks eye and her ringless fell. And a gentle breeze played around her shoulder. Brola, see if you'll mind, and care to lie on a bed of feathers. Let us silks and satins that you will shine and you'll be my queen among the heather now she said kind sir your offer is good but I'm afraid it was Meant for laughter, for I know you are some rich squire's son. How else I'm a poor lame shepherd's doctor? Ah, but had you been a shepherd? I heard in yours in yonder valley, or had you been a blooming sun?
lovely time for me, especially because it's just been a joy. And to see so many folk that I haven't seen for a long time. Um, can I thank Jamie and Mike of Transgressive North for the films? I thought they did a super job, brought her back to life. Um, thank you all for coming along and also um, thank you to the people that, that run this establishment because I remember when I came here a long, long time ago, I went away home with two words in my head and it was dream catcher. And this place has caught many a dream for many a story teller. So I have got Donald Smith to thank for mm -hmm. that. And, uh, and I think we should thank him again. just point you all to the map of stories this is please look at map of stories .scot. this is more than loads of things going on it is a map isn't it scotland is a map of stories we have got um millions of them and there's only two people that are the same story although we call it the same story it could be selfie it could be kelpie it could be anything but we have our own ways of um, of injecting them into each other I could go on all night, folks, but I haven't got all night to go on, so thank you so much. <laughs>